The Unnameable 2, the statement of Randolph Carter, is based off the H.P. Lovecraft short story, The Statement of Randolph Carter. Man, these guys couldn't make up an original movie title to save their lives. This time, Carter and Howard are back to put an end to the unnameable monster once and for all. The movie picks up right where the last one left off, with the kids outside the house. The police taking out all the dead bodies. Ordinarily, the cops would question the kids, thinking that clearly they were involved in the murders. But not this town. Everyone's heard the tales of the creature that lives in this old house. They know what happened. It was supernatural. Howard is taken to the hospital where he snuck in the Necronomicon, which Bookworm Carter is excited to see. He got a glimpse of the tunnels in the graveyard. He knows what dug him, and he has to go back. But Carter's going to need some help. Once he leaves the hospital, Howard's left alone to take a quick nap. But every time he closes his eyes, the monster invades his nightmares. It gets to the point where Joshua Woodthrup, the demon's father, and the old man in the first movie, comes to him as a ghost to warn him of what it would mean for the earth if the demon were to escape. And it's not good. You must destroy it. I cannot. Now, this isn't real. Carter meets with Chancellor Thayer, played by David Warner. I'm surprised to see him here. Carter wants to bring light to the monster, make it be known to the world that this is real. Call the newspapers and get the press, the whole shebang. But Thayer knows better. No one would believe him. It's best to just leave these forces alone. But Carter won't stand for that. So he goes to Professor Warren, John Ray's Davies. Another surprising face. This movie must have had a bigger budget than its prequel. Anyway, Carter goes to Warren for some help, and he shows him the ancient Necronomicon. As a scholar himself, he's quite impressed. Together, they figure out that Joshua used the book to turn his daughter into the creature. This is all too tempting for Warren, and he agrees to join Carter in exploring the tunnels under the house. We have to find this thing and prove it's real. They stop by the hospital to pick up Howard, and before you know it, they're back at the mansion. Howard stays topside, while Carter and Warren head on down, linked together with an intercom. This is the part of the movie that follows the book, The Statement of Randolph Carter. It's done quite well, with the two finding artifacts as they go. For example, this stone monolith with the language of Cthulhu. They go deeper and deeper until they find it. The unnameable, wrapped up in the roots of the tree spirit. Warren gets a blood sample, and they take a closer look at it. Human cells mixed with something else. They pass right through each other. The human blood cells existing simultaneously with whatever those gray cells are. The human side of this creature is still in there. The way they separate the two is by injecting insulin into the creature. That way the demon cells think that something's wrong with the human body, and it'll try to escape. Feeling the effect. Luckily it works, and after a bit of a light show, Aleda is free of the demon that once held her for 300 years. But what about the creature? Where did it go? They search in the book for a spell to destroy it, but the pages are missing, located in the school's library. For now, they're just going to have to take the girl and get out of there. But Warren can't give up yet. He tries to kill the monster by himself, but proves to be unsuccessful. Probably just because they didn't have the budget to keep paying John Ray's Davies. The others make it back into town and back to their dorms, where we see a couple more of Carter's friends. 
confused as to why he has a naked lady with him. Worse yet, a lady is from the 1700s, and she must have been turned into that creature when she was pretty young, because she can't really speak. Yes, mm -hmm. Elida. Their plan is to get her to a professional to try to age her. If they can prove that she's 300 years old, then that would mean their story was legit. But first things first, you got to get her dressed. I'm not going to hurt you, but, but you got to wear something. I wish I had this problem. A naked woman in my room refusing to put on a shirt. Stand still, would you? Meanwhile, the demons made it to the school, and it's ticked off. Wanting Alayda's body back. Do you blame it? They tried to meet with some teachers who can take a sample of Alayda to see how old she is. But they're all a no-show. I mean, it is 2.30 in the morning. Carter's pretty upset that he can't get a hold of anyone. But not a Leda who hasn't had any in 300 years. This chick's DTF. Just then, the professor shows up. But the monster attacks before he could do anything. Scared, he and Aleda escape to the library to hide out in the rows and rows of books, the creature following their scent. They manage to escape into an air duct and then into the restricted section where the missing pages of the Book of the Dead are. Only problem, they're not translated, and Carter doesn't know how to read it. But Aleda does. You speak this? She remembers her father trying to teach her when she was little. You speak the language of Cthulhu? So while Carter musters through, she gives him the correct pronunciation. While that's going on, the cops are trying to get to the bottom of all this and just getting killed in the process. The creature's just about to attack when Carter reads from the book. Can't have her. But it doesn't really do anything. Instead, it's Aleda who manages to control the beast, sacrificing herself to save Carter. Right before the two become one, Carter gathers the strength to push her out. And before she can transfer back to Aleda, he puts a chair in the way. And, yep, you guessed it, the demon is now a chair. What? It was that easy? That's all you had to do? Carter confesses his love for Aleda who turns into an old lady and dies. It would seem like the two were connected. If the demon goes, she does too. And that was The Unnameable 2. A good way to wrap some things up they left behind in the first movie. I like how they got Howard and Carter back, but what about Tanya? She was only in it for about two seconds, and they had to recast her. I did like all the humor they threw in for a pretty serious horror movie. I found myself laughing quite a bit, especially with the whole Elida not wanting to wear clothes bit. Carter leading the monster into the library to try to get lost into the books was actually pretty interesting. A library isn't scary, but at least it's unique. It reawakens a fear you had when you were a kid and your mom took you to the library only for you to get lost in stacks of books. Again, just like the first, you can tell they were inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, but took their own liberties, which is fine. The creature looked good, but this time it had full-grown wings, which before it just had little nubs. For some reason, nubs are scarier. I would say watch Unnameable 2 if you like the first one. It's more the same with a few familiar faces. I give it two and a half demon chairs out of four. You gotta be kidding. Carter with a naked woman in his room. I mean, this is monumental.